I'm delighted to be here. Um, first, I want to tell you a little bit about how I got to Ghana for this experience and why. I learned about the Triennial Congress in August. Somehow, I had missed the information that came in the spring. And the deadline for registering was June 15th, and here it was, August. So I wanted to be there to be able to learn the stories of women from around the world who were going there. To me, that was the most important part of the Congress. So I wanted to be there. First, I had to get permission to register two months late. Secondly, and I got that, secondly, I had to get a, a, an air flight itinerary so that I could apply for an expedited visa to Ghana. And I had to get lodging there. On Tuesday, I got the expedited visa. On Wednesday, I got lodging. On Thursday morning, I was on the flight. I don't usually travel that way. The handout that's on the back table shows the reality tours that our developing world leads. I plan months in advance. So this kind of hurry up and be there was really stressful. And the flight is long. It took essentially two days to get there. But I got there in time and I heard these stories and I knew that I had done the right thing. But in addition, one of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom members of San Jose branch started a GoFundMe for it. And I was just astounded because people donated for me to go there. I had never ever in my life try to raise funds for me. I raise funds for low-income students to go on our developing world reality tours. But never for me. I was just humbled and overwhelmed. And I have so enjoyed giving these programs to bring some of these women to you. Um, and I welcome more invitations if you know of other organizations that want this program, or one on the Mayan system of justice, or after the reality tour I'm leading to Cuba in February about the changes in, in Cuba from 1981, the first tour that we led, to 2019. This scarf and there's one left back there that I brought back, is a Picasso drawing that Wilf had got permission because it's 103 years old, so they were able to talk with Picasso and say, can we use this as a logo? This scarf I saw, um, I bought a couple to sell in our craft sale, and there's some more crafts back there. But I saw a Lebanese young woman asking women to sign one. And I thought, that's a brilliant idea, so I brought another one. And so I have signatures of many of the women who were there. I hate to, th to think of washing it because I think I'd lose their signatures. But the same young woman from Lebanon was wearing this t-shirt. And I had seen the t-shirt for sale. And I, I love the logo. But it was white. And I'm a purple person. <laughs> so I complimented her on it. And she said, it was the last purple one. I'll give it to you. Now, this is the spirit of Wilf Triennial. 
I'd never seen her before. She had never seen me. She was probably 40 years younger than I am. Amazing. These courageous women who came were inspirational. At the end of the Congress, I asked permission to speak to the whole group. And I said, thank you for energizing me, for giving me hope, and inspiring me. I think you can see why women from all over the world with incredible obstacles, much more than the ones I had, tried desperately to get there. One of the things that women in Africa, in many countries in Africa, do when there's a special occasion is go to their textile mills and say, we need a special cloth made to help us commemorate this occasion. This is one that I got from Mozambique when we led reality tours there. And they use it as a skirt wrap. Now there were women who were using their milled, special milled cloth as a skirt wrap. But there were also women there from, oh, I didn't bring it up, but on the table back there, there are some, um, a wallet and a little coin purse that was made by um, the Ghana women to commemorate the event. And they not only made them, um, they not only made them into useful um, wallets and so forth, but they also made blouses with little peplums. And another country used theirs to make um, full length garments. And another one made them to um, make jackets. And they would, on occasion, all of them in one country, wear what they made. So you could tell these were the folks from Mali and these were the folks from um, Congo and so forth. I thought it was such a delightful way of introducing themselves to everyone else, but also, and commemorating something that they thought was important, but, but also giving a sense of solidarity. And isn't that something we all need? Big time. Um, there are many women from Africa who live in the UK, many of them in London. They were members of WILF is Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. They were members of WILF in their own country. Now they are members of the UK brand, uh, section, but they also have their own caucus, and they keep in touch with people, with women in their own countries, so that they can help them in any way that the people in those countries suggest. They don't suggest. They ask the people in their African countries to tell them what they need. This reminds me of a book that was written in Guatemala called Doing Good Says Who. And essentially, 
they're saying the same thing. We don't go into a country, if we want to be effective, we don't go into a country and say, we'll do this for you. If we go into the country, we ask them what they need that we could help with. So that also was the spirit of this triennial. We listened to people. We listened to women tell their stories. Not only the ones from the UK, but one of my dearest South African friends, Nazizwe Routledge, whom I met in 1975. She was very active in adult education and was imprisoned by the apartheid government to, because she was helping activate the women. She became a parliamentarian when Nelson Mandela was elected and my husband and I were privileged to be peace and election monitors for that historic event. Probably the most historic event that I've ever experienced. I will never forget it. She now is not in the parliament because younger women said, you should step down so that we can have younger people in the parliament, younger women in the parliament. And that's the kind of woman she is. She is concerned about all of the people and she is concerned about mentoring younger people. So she has started a focus that she calls embracing diversity, uh, excuse me, embracing dignity. She works with women who have been trafficked, both black and white and Asian, in South Africa, helping those who have been affected, trying to abolish prostitution, and stopping the exploitation of women and girls. She founded this after she served 15 years in the parliament. She decided that yes, she would go because she was asked to speak at the triennial. And when I saw her name on the program, I knew I had come to the right place because she had something to offer that spoke to all of us and certainly to all of the women who were there where unfortunately prostitution, trafficking, and exploitation of women is a big concern. And many of the women that I met were involved in that. Rosemary from Uganda started the organization Stop the Silent Suffering. I thought at first that it was also about helping women, but it turned out it wasn't because they don't have a very helpful, free health care in Uganda. Mothers who have children who have um, cognitive and spinal problems have banded together to support each other. It is a sad and almost impossible situation because they're not going to get better. But these women support each other and help take care of each other's children to give the mothers a little break. Why would she, why would she take the time and try to raise the money 
to get to the Triennial Congress. Any ideas? No ideas? This is not a rhetorical question. It has answers. Well, I spoke of the solidarity. And she could tell her story. She could be heard by women around the world. She could get ideas. She could get comfort. She could get caring. We're now in email contact. Hanan Awad is a woman who was on a speaking tour here and she spoke at our San Jose branch of Wilf. She remembered me. I was astounded because she met so many people around the country. But she remembered me and she treated me like a long lost sister. I was, I was just so in awe of her. She lives in Jerusalem, in East Jerusalem, that used to be Palestinian, but the Israelis have taken it over. When I was there in 2013, I met a family who, whose belongings were in the street because a Jewish family had taken them out and taken over the home. We didn't even hear about that then. We've heard about it since our embassy was moved. But she, she said, I never know when I go to sleep, if the military is going to come in and knock down the door. I never know if I'm going to be assaulted. This is her daily life. Why would she come? It's very difficult for Palestinians to leave Palestine and then be able to come back. But she took that chance because she wanted to be able to tell the story. And she wanted wilf sections all over the world to help Palestinians in their policies and their what they want. What are the Palestinians asking us to do? BDS, boycott, divest, and sanctions. When you are in Israel and Palestine, you not only have your visa, but you have an extra little thing that you've got to have with you all the time or you're not going to be able to move around. And who has made this electronic stuff? HP. So Hewlett Packard is doing some of their, some of Israel's technical stuff that keeps Palestinians from coming into Jerusalem, keeps tourists from going into Palestine if they don't have the right stuff. So divesting from HP, boycotting HP stuff is what Palestinians are asking us to do to help them. Again, it's not our decision. It's what they're asking the world to do. Unfortunately, some of our legislators think that's anti-Semitic. It has nothing to do with Jewish people, per se. 
it has to do with Israeli government actions. And that's different, very, very different. Hanan invited me to come and said she would help me with a tour. So I'm thinking about organizing a tour to Palestine and Israel in 2020. If any of you are interested, please give me, I, I have a clipboard back there. I'd like to have your email address so I can let you know when and what it's going to be about. Jamila from Afghanistan and her friend also from Afghanistan couldn't even get a, um, oh, what shot was it? Um, yellow fever shot in Afghanistan. She couldn't, they couldn't get Ghana visas in Afghanistan. I should have asked them where they finally got them. I, maybe they had to go to China, who knows? But they went through all of those obstacles before they left. Then when they got to the airport, it was closed. So they had to sit and sit and sit until it finally opened, wondering if they were ever going to get there. The night before Jamila left, her brother was killed by a U.S. bomb. So we're not unrelated to these obstacles. But they went through all of those to go there. Why? Because they needed that solidarity. They needed that opportunity to tell their stories. They needed to be able to talk with women from all over the world and work together to see how we could help each other. Dr. Miriam Suleiman lives in London now. She was the voice of Darfur women. She is an Ethiopian Quaker. And she shared from, actually she, Nazi, Nazi's way was going to meet her husband Jeremy in Ethiopia after the Triennial Congress. So Dr. Miriam Suleiman gave her contacts in Ethiopia, which really made that trip much, much deeper and more rewarding, Nazi's way has told me. Again, this openness to sharing. In Cameroon, women from many countries fled the war and went to London. As I told you, they have a caucus now. They told me about a Congo men's network. They feel this is very, very important to educate men, not to exploit women. We have a similar movement here, don't we? With Me Too and yesterday at the Women's March, that was very evident. Amina from Lebanon is the one who gave me this shirt and had the idea of getting signatures on this scarf. She must have been in her 20s. She has worked with hundreds of imams, the leader of a Muslim congregation is called an imam. 
she has engaged hundreds of them to lead discussions with men to end domestic violence and gender-based violence and to educate boys also. This is changing the atmosphere in Lebanon. She also works with refugees, Palestinians and Jordanians. Lebanon is a very small country, but they have been for decades helpful to refugees. And they've been plagued by Israeli attacks for that. So when she goes into the refugee camps, she's never sure whether there's going to be a bombing. But she keeps on keeping on. Amazing, courageous women. These are just a few of the ones that I have met. And I thank all the donors who got me there and all the people who helped me and the incredible experience of being there. I, that's why I want to do, well that's why I wanted to go there is to learn these stories and then share them with people because if we don't know we're weaker in terms of being able to operate in any way to make the world a better place. And isn't that what we're all about? I hope. I'm a, let me just tell you a little bit about the, the Ghanaians themselves. One of the experiences that I wanted, and I organized a group to go to Elmina. Elmina is about three hours away from Accra on the water. And um, there was a day where the focus was on people who were new to wealth. Well, since I'd been a member for 61 years, uh, I didn't have to be there, and neither did Nazi. And so we got about seven people, and we went up to Elmina. It is the site of a castle that was used to house and brutalize kidnapped Ghanaians, who then were sent off to be slaves. That area of Elmina was first taken over by the Portuguese and then by the Danes and then by the Brits and the Brits were the ones who were the slave leaders, the slave sellers. The young man who took us Is that me or? Okay, well, let's hope it doesn't happen again. Um, the. You should talk louder so I can turn the volume down here. It's giving feedback. Yeah. Okay. okay. The, um, the man, the young man who took us on tour didn't spare us much in terms of the misery that those Ghanaians lived in. It was horrible, and I'm not going to go into the details. It was so horrible. Then we saw where the boats went out. It was a coral reef, so the big boats couldn't come in. They had to be put on small boats that went out to the big boat, where they were stacked like lumber to be shipped to the United States and to the Caribbean islands. 
At the end of the tour, the young man said, we offer this tour because we don't want it ever to happen again. On the way out, just before the exit, there was an area that was about three times as big as this room with crafts vendors. And I thought to myself, what we just saw was the past. What we're seeing now is the present and the future. And Paul was the one in the first kiosk. I didn't get beyond that because I learned so much from him. He did woodwork. This is all I have left that he's done. His mom did these kinds of things. She also did beadwork and he did too, but I don't have any left. But I thought this mother was so wonderful to encourage the creativity in her son so he could carry on a tradition that is so vital to the people in Ghana. We are losing that. We have already lost a lot of it with our Native Americans who can't compete with the cheap weaving that comes from India and Mexico. So they aren't doing any more. I treasure my Native American weavings. The, uh, her, her spirit in encouraging her son is something that speaks to the future of Ghana. And so I was delighted to be able to help. They also go into the villages and buy baskets so that those villagers have a market. They pay for them up front and then they sell them. I don't have any left. But I do have a painting back there of a village that they go to. I, I love handcrafts. And when we go on our reality tours, there's a flyer there that speaks of the um, one in July in a to Lake Atit Lawn in Guatemala. I always include craftspeople and I get to know their stories so that I can tell them with the crafts. That is my educational outreach because I have found that people love beautiful things. And if you can tell a story about them, all the better. So I carry them around whenever I give programs and I have you know, a number of places that I carry them to during the holidays. But I want to leave a little time for questions, right? Okay, am I speaking loud enough? Just a little louder. A little louder, okay, a question? Hold on a sec, um, will you please wait for the microphone and remember, hold it like this, close to your mouth. Who's got a question? Question. Do you have a question? Oh, come on. Okay. We're coming. Um, I just want to thank you. Uh, something you said that often falls upon deaf ears, the difference between anti-Semitism and opposition to oppressive governmental actions. Thank you. Thank you. I think she had a question. Who is that? Oh. Thanks. Um, as a WILP member, I was just curious about the outcome if they'd made at this um, Ghana meeting any like uh, actions or directions for WILP in the coming year. I wish I could answer that more fully because, frankly, I was disappointed. 
um, we didn't manage to get an action in regard to Palestine. Theoretically, they're living, they're, they're working on it internationally, and it will come about, but we didn't get what we, what we needed, which was boycott, divest, and sanctions from um, pushing governments all around the world. Um, there, for some reason, there was a, I don't think order, but a suggestion that there be a composite re resolution, and I didn't get it, so I can't tell you what it's about, I'm sorry. Um, obviously, anti-nuclear ending war everywhere, removing bases. I mean, there was, there was a lot of interest in getting rid of bases, all, U.S. bases all over the world. That I can tell you. Sorry. Anybody else? Um, I'm curious, in addition to discussions of the Palestinian issue and BDS, were there discussions about issues much closer to home for Africa, for, you know, for example, the unrest in Somalia, right now what's going on in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Congo where, they're, um, where the election is being disputed, what's going on in Somalia and Nigeria, which Somalia would, appears to be a failed state, South Sudan, I mean there's so much going on in Africa and just this weekend a couple of hundred migrants have died on the way from Libya to Italy. So, is is there was there discussion about things closer to home? Yes, there were. Um, there were all kinds of um, of workshops on various subjects, and then there were there were summaries of those. I went to one about violence, and um, the whiteboard was filled with. Causes and actions, and um, the African nations met together in a workshop, and they um, shared the importance of all of the sections working to end war in Africa and find peaceful solutions. Um, there, uh, there were, I mean, it was, it was a very heavy discussion always. But the wonderful thing about the Ghanaians is that, that they understood that with all of this, these heavy discussions, it had to be balanced. So they would bring in music and people would get up and dance. And I th finally realized that's why they were always smiling. I call Ghana the land of smiles. And I could pick out Ghanaians in an airport or on a plane because they were smiling and I was always right. So I think it's because they knew how to balance life. So yes, we always have heavy experiences, but we've got to balance it with some joy. And that often is dancing and music. Didn't quite under answer your question, but maybe afterward. Yeah. So was there any discussion about uh small arms because uh, a AK-47 goes for about $30 in Africa and bullets are flowing in from all over the world so and in some cases like she was mentioning South Sudan yeah, it's almost impossible to stop a conflict when there's I wasn't so many guns. part of any discussion of that and um, and I don't remember any reporting about that anybody else Ah. Just a short question. I, I, I wonder a lot about 
international uh, NGO meetings. Are, are they conducted exclusively in English? No. What, what um, other languages? There were, um, there were many French-speaking countries, and there were Spanish-speaking countries, and there was translation. Um, they, the executive committee was made up of 51 members from 51 countries um, over many time zones. It was evidently very, very difficult to, I mean, you couldn't get everybody involved in one phone call because of the time differences and so forth. So they, the, and the languages, they, um, for this next three years, they're going with regions, and frankly, I don't think it's going to work, but we'll see. Um, the region that the U.S. section is in starts in Canada and goes all the way down to the tip of South America with one representative. I can't remember which country that representative is from. I think it may be Costa Rica. I'm not sure. I, I don't see how <laughs> one representative could, could represent all of the issues from Canada to the tip of South America. And there's one that's North Africa and the Middle East. I mean, it's just too broad. But this was to make the executive committee smaller. So we'll see if it works. They're going to try it for three years. Um, I don't know whether that wondering. quite answers your question, but it's... No, it does, it does, thank you. I was also wondering, and kind of related, um, you're talking about English, French. These are major international languages. I was wondering if they're local Ghanaians uh, uh, had had translators. You, you say the, the, the speeches are translated. Are they translated live, like at the UN? Yeah. Um, yes. The translation is is through earphones, and everything did go on actually in English, except when the French speaking people caucused for several of the workshops. And same thing with the Spanish, um, but English was the the main language. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Um, I don't know. Do you have any? Um, knowledge, uh, experience, comment regarding the um, food flotilla and um, do you know anybody at the Peace and Justice Center that can come here and speak about that? Yes, Donna Wallach. Um, if the Peace and Justice Center would have her um, contact information and Donna lived in Palestine she's Jewish but she she and her twin sister who unfortunately died um, over a year ago lived in Palestine and um, she was on one of the boats um, and she we had a speaker we had Anne Wright who um, is on the flotilla, uh, speak at the Peace and Justice Center. And Donna would be the one to contact to give a talk here. Yeah, sure. Hi, <clears throat> this is not regarding the talk, but it's also from your flyer. I have a question. Yes. Um, is there any kind of interchange, like in terms of labor be between Western from here, going over there, and learn from the local culture and help out the women, interchange of technology and ideas and all this stuff to work with the uh -huh, 
local women to produce stuff? Did I make my clear? <laughs> I'm saying, is, are there women from here or men going over to those countries, learning their trade, as well as interchange of technology and learning from each other, instead of just visiting them and learning the culture there, but also working with them in terms of learning from each other and producing things together, uh, bringing the technology and the AI concepts from here, but also learning from the local area uh, people there. I don't, Jointly I don't know of this happening, but it's, it's an international organization. The international headquarters are in Geneva, and if anything like that is going on, Geneva would know about it, but I don't personally know about it. Who organizes these trips? That's why I'm referring to that the trips are like study tour or visiting Guatemala to learn about those. Our developing world does that. That's me. <laughs> We're an all volunteer nonprofit, 49 years old. I know, but what I'm saying is that do you also work with the local groups? in terms of exchanging ideas and technology and work with and to produce oh. jointly? I think the answer really is a one-way street, mostly. That is, we go to learn from them. So, for example, to Lake Atitlan, we, one of the things we do is meet with the counselors of the province of Solola, which is all of the um, cities and villages around the lake, which is 5,000 feet high, so it's always temperate. There are no mosquitoes. It's just incredible. It's a little bit of paradise. It's so beautiful. We learn from those counselors about the Mayan system of justice, which is a restorative justice system. Um, <laughs> We visit cooperatives. There are lots of cooperatives, weavers, cooperatives, and so forth. And we learn how they're organized. We don't go there to teach or to work. We bring donations that my friend Chati, who runs the hotel we stay at, says are needed and we give them to her and she gets them out to the people who need them. We don't play Santa Claus. But in terms, sorry, in terms of our going there to do something besides learn from them, no, we don't. We were going to lead a service learning tour for middle school kids to, again, to Nicaragua last year. But that was canceled because of the violence there. And um, when I asked my friend Chati if um, she could organize it for Guatemala, she said, sure. But the parents looked on the State Department <coughs> list and Guatemala was listed as three for traveling, which is not recommended. <clears throat> Unfortunately, that was in, it was dated 2013, <clears throat> and I've experienced this before. Not only is the State Department travel advisory old, but it's also usually only affecting the capital and not the rest of the country. So, but parents who didn't travel didn't know that and so they pulled out so we didn't have that service learning. Uh, that was, I mean, the service <coughs> learning for kids is going there and doing something that the people say they need. Yeah. Uh, here. Oh. Occasionally, I've watched some of these documentaries on Africa. And what you see are these women and the girls 
hauling water in the woods, firewood. Meanwhile, the men are sitting on their ass playing dominoes. Now, is this my imagination, or is this prevalent in these societies where the men don't do a damn thing? Well, that's not really quite true. Um, many, many men um, are away from home working in factories or, or mines. Um, many men are raising crops for export. Unfortunately, that has a downside because um, the, the companies they export to um, suggest that they raise a monocrop, just one crop, and they need more land and they take it from the women who raise the food crops for the family. Um, so that, you know, that is not a good thing. But um, let's say that by and large the idea of men helping in the household hasn't reached a lot of men. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I think we've got something. Yeah, I, there. I was going to follow next. up the, uh, on the um, discussion that we started. That was uh, a little bit more, maybe you with uh, Central or South America, but relates to the our developing world. And you've been working on this for so many years. Has leadership through through the participation selling different things that you do has the leadership uh, uh, opportunities for women the ev evolution of that changed over the years and and I'll give you a little background from, from my own experience going back a number of decades there were already women that were traveling from town to town in various um, places there and and selling things they had independence um, they, in a traditional way, they could sell their own weavings, like in Guatemala. Um, have things changed for the better or for the worse? Are they m more able to uh, be economically independent, to make their own choices, to be able to grow? Or do you, or do you still see it the same through your work with our developing world? That's a very hard question to generalize over the whole world. Um, I, most of the craftspeople are women. And um, I, I think that that they've been independent for a long time in terms of being able to sell their wares. Uh, if they're way out in the boonies, that's difficult. But when you have somebody like Paul and his mother in Ghana who go out to the villages and buy, and that's new, and that helps the people in the boonies, the women in the boonies who make the baskets. Um, I mean, since it's a very difficult question because often it's the major cities that people go to. And there are craft centers there. But we don't only go to the major cities, we go to the boonies. So I have, I have only seen people who are independent and who have been able to make it through the decades. Um, I've got a follow-up to the situation in Guatemala and the State Department reports and they're being old. They also can be blatantly false. I was in Guatemala in 1981 and those were even tougher times to go there because you went through a travel agency and it was illegal for a travel agency to sell you on Guatemala and we had to work to get them to get our tickets. I, yeah, I, I wish I was making this up. I, w I was visiting a friend there and they had to pave the way. And be, 
just before we embarked for Guatemala, there was a report from the State Department saying that there had been a bombing at the U.S. Embassy. It had been destroyed. I got there. I saw the embassy in Guatemala City. It was not destroyed. Yes, there was a bomb. The car was across the street, and sadly, one U.S. Marine was killed. But it was completely exaggerated. And then the same State Department had issued warnings about if you go to Greece, you can't go to um, Turkey. If you can't, the, the visa won't allow you to do it in the same trip. It turned out that was false also. So you have to take the State Department warnings with a big grain of salt. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that. And it's uh, sad that their advisories have a lot to do with our own foreign policy. Yeah. Um, you were mentioning the trafficking of women that was going on in Africa. And uh, what countries were you talking about? Well, I'd say all of them that were, that were represented there, the Congo, Uganda, Rwanda, Mali, um, Ethiopia, uh, there's some in Ghana, I probably left South Africa, Mozambique, I mean it's widespread. pervasive. What is the attitude of the government towards this? Did they try to intervene to help the women or I don't are think they pretty so. much on their own? I don't think so. Going? That's why so many of the women in WILF focus on that. I'm sorry I didn't get your answer. I, I don't think, as far as I know, there's no government help in any of these countries. That's why the women in WILF, who are at the Congress, focus on this problem. Mm -hmm. So did they have any suggestions for them at your, at your Congress for Women? Well, what they could do to Nazi's try to help? Way talked about her organization and embracing dignity yeah. and so I mean that's they shared what they were doing so that other groups can can do the same can yeah. help them with their yeah. empowerment to get away from it right if they want to so did they take the women from one part of the country to another country or do you know how what they I, do I, I think it was mostly internal uh-huh. And how young are these women? Some of them are in their teens. Of course, we have it in the United States, too. Oh, yes. But we have help from the government for people that are kidnapped and taken to places if they find out about it. Yes. Yes. 